It's wonderful to see you all here this morning. Um, I've been uh, just here to worship the Lord and lay our weeks aside, and we've all been through whatever we've been through this week, but there's nothing like being in the presence of the Lord. And um, so let's take a moment to just take a breath, focus our thoughts, and just to um, get ready to meet with him. Amen. So Father God, we just, we're here to meet with you this morning. Father, we're here to praise you. We're here to enter into your presence. God, we invite you into our worship. Lord God, and um, just be in our midst. Lord, we love you. We, we praise you. We thank you for all the many blessings that you give us in our lives each and every day. We thank you for answered prayers. We thank you for unanswered prayers when you have our best interest in mind. Father God, we just thank you, Lord, and we love you. In Jesus' name. the privilege of spending most of yesterday in a room full of like 300 worshipers and it was I have to say like the energy as you can imagine was awesome um, and it reminded me in the Psalms they he says shout to the Lord with a joy and make a joyful noise unto the Lord so I would just in like to invite everybody to Stand, engage, clap your hands, just sing unto the Lord, dance if you feel like dancing, just be free. 
as we worship the Lord because he is worthy Amen. each and every day, all the time.
Father God, we just thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that your grace is enough, Father God, and there is nothing that we can do to deserve your grace and to deserve your mercy, Lord, but you give it to us freely. Father God, and we are just so grateful. Lord, you are King of kings and Lord of lords, and there is none like you. And there is no place that we would rather be than in your presence. So, Father, we thank you for your presence here this morning. And, Lord, we bask in your glory. And we just love you, Lord. And we just thank you for bringing us here this morning. Hallelujah. Thank you. 
Oh. 
we thank you that your grace, your grace, Lord, is sufficient for all our needs and for all our cares. Lord, we just thank you for your work that you've done for us. We thank you for all the blessings and all the gifts you've given in our lives, even though sometimes we find it hard to see them. Lord, we just now ask that you would come down and meet with us here, Lord, in this place, that you would just give us a peace in today. Just open up our hearts, Lord, so that what we hear is from you. Lord, we just again thank you for, for all that you have done in our lives, for all that you will do in our lives, and for the gift that you have given, the gift of salvation, the gift of eternity, Lord, and mostly the gift that we can cast all our cares upon you. Lord, we just ask this in your son's name, Jesus. Amen. Good morning. I think maybe we're a little loud. Just a tad. I know Charlie does that, so I'm just trying to be like him. <laughs> so, take a few moments. Say hi to somebody as close as you want to get. You can wave. You can fist bump. Um, as to masks, it's completely up to you. You know, if you're vaccinated and you feel safe, you can go without. If you feel concerned and want to wear it, feel concerned. I will be wearing it after I'm done speaking. Pretty hard to speak and wear it at the same time. Although I was thinking if I did that, I could just play a soundtrack and I wouldn't have to have my lips match up. So you wouldn't know that I wasn't really doing it. Be a way to get through this. Okay. Again, good morning. I'm Pastor Dave. Charlie and Don are away for the weekend, so I, I am up on deck, as they say, if you're a sports fan. Um, the next batter up, so uh, we'll get through this. Um, announcements, there really aren't too many. We've got uh, prayer this Tuesday, 7 p.m., 7 to 8, and we've got the Bible study, um, the evening's Bible study on Wednesday, Wednesday the evening study, we go through the book of, books of the Old Testament, so we're up to the book of Psalms, and so we, you can come and enjoy the Psalms as well. So again, seven to eight, um, I think that really covers all of them. I think we're going to be inside more now than we were outside. The weather is not necessarily cooperative, and we're never sure what it's going to be at uh, 10 o'clock, so we thought it's safer to be inside today. So uh, that's why we're here, and we'll probably be in more now than we were out. Anybody have anything? Okay. So let's, uh, let's go to prayer. We're going to pray for some of the needs that uh, we know of. If you have a need, just bow your head and take it to God. He, uh, he can hear you as well as He can hear me, as well as He can hear anybody else. And in fact, oddly enough, as, it, as odd it seems, he can hear all of us at the same time everywhere. So let's just take this to God in prayer. Father God, we come to you again very thankful for all that you have done for us, for all that you've given us. And Lord, we are extremely thankful that we can bring our cares to you. Lord, we bring Larissa with her head pain and her neck pain to you. Lord, we don't know what's necessarily going on, but you do. We ask that you would just intervene in that situation, work in her life, touch her head. Lord, we also bring up Bob. We thank you that uh, the treatments seem to be working. But we again pray that you would keep him in peace, continue to touch him and touch the doctors so that the treatments he on, he or he's on will, uh, will ultimately prove that uh, everything gets fixed up. Lord, we pray for... Uh, Billy and Andrea for their daughter as they go through testing and trials in that area. Lord, it's always difficult when a family has a, a young child that needs testing. We think of uh, Steve and his family, Lord, with his daughter going through the, the uh, journey of um, diabetes. We pray for peace and, and love on that family, Lord. Lord, we just bring everyone up that, uh, that you know of, that you're hearing right now to you. Lord, just touch them, give them peace, give them a sense of well-being. And Lord, just lay again your hand on this, this service this day. And we ask, Lord, that 
you would bring a blessing to everyone who's physically here and who's listening, on, listening online just because they've tuned in to hear your word. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Okay. Um, oh, I got it. So, this morning, we're going to be looking at an epistle of Paul's. Now, that word epistle seems like a highfalutin word, but it really just means a letter. So, we're going to look at one of the letters that Paul wrote. And in particular, we're going to be looking at the epistle of 2 Timothy this morning. Now, 2 Timothy is a New Testament book. It happens to be about halfway between Acts, where we've been, and Revelation. It's in what I call the T section. You've got 1 and 2 Thessalonians, you've got 1 and 2 Timothy, and then you've got Titus. In fact, those five books, starting with T, are the only five books in the entire 66 books of the Bible that start with the letter T. So if you're looking for it, just look in the T section. Look under T in your Bible. Um, <clears throat> now, I'm going to have a spoiler alert here. Charlie has been going through the book of Acts, and we've been talking about a guy named Saul. And that's how we've been referencing Saul. But Saul wasn't al isn't always Saul, and that's where the spoiler alert comes in. Saul in the book of Acts is actually Paul. If you didn't want to know that, it's too late. You've already heard it. Spoiler alert is over. But uh, Paul and Saul, Paul I'm talking about, and Saul we hear in an act, same guy, same person, just different names. You may remember that at one point in time, somebody else had their name changed. This specifically by Jesus. Remember a guy by the name of Simon? Simon had his name changed too. In fact, we see this in Mark 3.16, where Jesus says, Simon, to whom he, that is Jesus, gave the name Peter. It wasn't until the book of John that we actually find out why Jesus made this name change. And in fact, in John 1, 42, we see why Jesus changed Peter's name. And in 1, 42, we read, and he, that is Simon's brother, who brought Peter to Jesus, brought him, Simon, to Jesus. Now, when Jesus looked at him, he said, you are Simon, son of Jonah, which is translated in Aramaic as stone. Still doesn't get us to Peter, but Peter in Greek means stone. So Peter's name was changed. Paul's name was changed. Now, I guess one of the things we should ask is, why was Paul's name changed from Saul to Paul? You know, Saul is a good Jewish name. If you were a boy in that time or even a Jewish boy today, having the name Saul is a good thing. But even though Saul was Jewish, he was also a Roman citizen. And Paul is a good Roman name. So they say, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. So maybe that's why he had his name changed to Paul. So maybe when he was among the Jewish, he was Saul. Among the Gentiles, he was Paul. And in fact, Paul is the one that said, he became all things to all people, so that by all means he might save some. So Paul believed in presenting himself to everybody in a most comfortable way that's out there. But for now, while we're going through 2 Timothy, we're going to be um, calling him Paul. And we're in 2 Timothy. We're in the fourth chapter. We're going to be looking at the first eight verses of 2 Timothy, the fourth chapter. So that's the end of the spoiler alert. You now know something that we're not going to get into until the 13th chapter of Acts when we actually find out Paul's name get changed. So we're in chapter 9. you got a few to go, but you're ahead of the crowd now. So, 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 8. If you've got your Bibles, you can follow along. Follow along on the overhead. Let me read this for you. I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead as he, at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, 
but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you be watchful in all things, endure affliction, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry, for I am being already poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not to me only, but also to all who have loved his, his appearing. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the word. We thank you that we can openly and freely read this still that we can broadcast your word through the internet and that we have this freedom, a freedom that is not available to many in this world. Lord, there are those that are dying right now because they preach your word. So Lord, we realize, we understand that we are extraordinarily blessed in this country to be able to open this word, to study it, to understand it, and to broadcast to any who will listen. Lord, again, we just ask your hand on the service. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's, before we get into the text, let's look a moment at both the author of this book, which we know is Paul, and the recipient of this book, which is Timothy. Now, this letter to Timothy, 2 Timothy, is a very special letter. It's probably the most special letter Paul ever wrote, only because it's the last letter Paul will ever write. This particular book, the first, the uh, first, second Timothy, and Titus are called pastoral epistles. Now you might say, "Well, why are we doing that if none of us here are pastors?" It's not necessarily for people who are pastors. This is really written to all of us who believe that we should spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. What Paul is saying here is applicable to everybody at this time. Even though he's primarily writing this to two men who oversee the church, you and I can learn from this very well. Now, a few things about background on the way of Paul. Paul is coming near the end of his life. He's currently in Rome, in prison, under a death sentence. And he knows that it won't be long before his life is over. He's writing this letter around 68 A.D., and if you know anything about the history of that time, that's about two years before the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. I personally believe that God took Paul before he saw the destruction of the temple as a grace to Paul. Paul's death is a fact that he's keenly aware of. And when he writes these letters to Timothy, he doesn't write them with that in mind. He's not sorrowful over the fact that he's about to die, or he doesn't write of regrets of his life or fear of death, but he writes great words of optimism, but he intersperses them with great words of warning, warning that you and I should heed as well as Timothy did. As Paul comes to the end of his life, he wants to make sure that the churches he started are left in good hands but that these hands now know how to pastor his church. So a lot of this book is fundamental church administration 101. But these last few verses in this last chapter of 2 Timothy are, for more, are far more than that. In fact, one of the churches that Paul founded was in Ephesus, and he left Timothy there to oversee that church at one time. Paul spent most of his life planting churches and now he wants to be sure that he leaves behind men that will continue to minister to this church. Now, some of you may know that one of my favorite themes is the theme of last words. I like to know what somebody is saying at the end because those tend to be the most poignant words. Even our judicial system is aware of this to the point where a deathbed confession is administrable, is administrable into the court of law even if we can't cross-examine 
the person making this statement because they've died. Last words have weight. Last words take on a special meaning, especially if they're from Jesus or even here from Paul. Paul writing from Timothy, writing to Timothy is looking back over his earthly life, even as he looks forward to his eternal life. And he's going to give Timothy the wisdom of all the years that he spent serving Christ. Now, this is a much different Paul at this point in his life than the Paul that we're looking at in Acts. This Paul has been tempered by the hand of God. He's been molded like clay to be in the image of God. And so Paul's giving a much different series of, of um, ideas and concerns to Timothy than he might have while we're in still in Acts. Paul has one last chance here to tell Timothy what he wants, what he feels is most important in keeping the church, and what's most important to him also in telling Timothy how he feels. And this is most apparent in the opening two verses of chapter 1 of 2 Timothy, which is the beginning of this particular book. In verse 1 of chapter 1, we see that Paul indeed, first off, is the author. 1 Timothy 1, 1 says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, according to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus. In the face of his death, Paul can say, according to the promise of life. Not a chance of life, but a promise of life. Given by the only true promise keeper, Jesus Christ himself. And in verse 2, Paul tells us something about to whom this book is written. He says, to Timothy, a beloved son. Paul calls Timothy a beloved son. Now, he's not his flesh and blood biological child because Paul never married. But Timothy is his son in the faith. It's a spiritual reference here. And in fact, Paul goes ahead and redefines that in 1 Corinthians 4.17 so that we know exactly what he means by this. He says in Corinthians 4.17, For this reason I have sent Timothy to you, who is my beloved and faithful son in the Lord. So Paul is really writing this to Timothy as a son, as a father who is not going to be around much longer, is writing to a son to give him his words of wisdom. So now we've glimpsed a little at Paul, the author. Let's look a little bit at Timothy. Who is this guy, Timothy? And why is Paul writing to him, and does he have any qualifications? The first reference to Timothy is found in the Bible in the book of Acts, but it doesn't happen until chapter 16. In Acts 16, 1 and 2, we read these words. Then he, Paul, came to Derbe and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a certain Jewish woman who believed, but his father was Greek. He, Timothy, was well spoken of by the brethren who were at Lystra and Iconium. When Paul comes upon Timothy, Timothy is already a believer, a disciple. Also, we see that Timothy had a good reputation among the people, which are actually qualifications for people doing ministry. Now, Lystra, in verse 2, is a very interesting city. This isn't the first time that Paul was in Lystra. Now, I'm sure that meeting Timothy for the first time later in his life, Paul thought of it as a great memory, but I don't think Paul could ever forget what happened the first time he was in Lystra. The memory of Timothy would pale in comparison to the memory of what happened in Lystra. For it was in Lystra that Paul was stoned to death. And then God, not finished with him, raised him from the dead. Now, Timothy was in Lystra and Iconium at the time. It's possible that Timothy went to hear Paul when he was speaking. It's possible that he even was there when, Timothy, uh, when Paul was stoned, observing this. But even if Timothy wasn't physically there at that time, I'm sure he heard about it. Even small events at this time would have been gossiped about, and it was only about 30 miles in Iconium from Lystra, so it wasn't that far. So I'm sure if he wasn't there, he heard about this stoning. And can you imagine how much talk there would have been about a guy being stoned to death and then raised from the dead? 
So I'm not sure how much of this effect of the stoning and of Paul's resurrection might have been had on Timothy himself. He may w very well have used this as the seminal point of his conversion. It may have been this issue that he became a disciple of Jesus Christ. I lost my place. Okay. Now, it's interesting in that passage that we noted that Timothy's father was Greek. Now, the word Greek in this passage may mean Greek, but interestingly enough, it shows up 15 times in the New Testament, and 13 of those 15 times, it's not translated as Greek, it's translated as Gentile. So it's possible that what we're trying to get across here is that Timothy's father was a Gentile by the use of the word Greek, but more than likely, Timothy's father was not a believer. But we know from the passage that his mother was. We're told that Timothy's mother was a Jewish believer. And if you remember in the Jewish faith, to be Jewish, your mother has to be Jewish. So that's why Timothy was Jewish, because his mother was Jewish. Even though his father was Greek, wasn't a, a Jew, and maybe not a believer, Timothy was still Jewish through his mother. Paul tells us a little something about the maternal side of Timothy's life. In fact, in 2 Timothy verse one, the f or, uh, chapter 1, the fifth verse, we find a little bit about who Timothy's parents were. He says, when I call to remembrance, this is Paul speaking, the genuine faith that is in you, he's speaking to Timothy, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded is in you also. We see here that Timothy's initial faith was nurtured by his mother and his grandmother. I imagine that Timothy's grandmother, Lois, nurtured Timothy's mother, Eunice, and she became a believer, and that through the two of them, Timothy was exposed to the gospel as well. I believe that God is faithful to honor parents who bring up their children in the fear and nurture of the, of the Lord. In fact, in Ephesians, we read, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. And that's what Eunice and Lois did, his mother and grandmother, for Timothy. And that's why we can see him today in this, Bible, in, this, uh, in this passage. You know, our faithfulness as parents is not determined by results, but by our constant and faithful witness to our children. And here we are amazed at how the witness of these two led Timothy into a life that Paul could could use to continue his ministry. So we've looked at the author. We've looked at the recipient. I think it's time we finally get to the passage, don't you? Because you think, oh, well, how long is this going to be? So, back to 2 Timothy, chapter 4, the first verse. The first three words of this verse are the most important. He says, I charge you. With these three words, Paul's not messing around. Remember, this is chapter 4, 2 Timothy. This is it. He has nothing else to write after this. He's got to get it all said and done. The word charge used in verse is used other times in the Bible as well. But again, like the word Greek, it's only twice used here as charge. Every other time, it's either a, um, as a witness or as a testify, but never charge. The only two times charge is used is here in the, uh, the book of Timothy, the first and second book of Timothy. And so this term, as being used here by Paul, is really a legal term. It's kind of like, you know, going to court, and then you're a witness, and you got to stand up at the, 
uh, uh, and put your hand on the Bible. I'm sure they probably don't do that anymore today. And you know the words, the words that they always tell you to repeat. If you've watched any TV shows, you know, I solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God, those kind of words. Well, that's what the word charge here is saying, is Peter, Paul is saying to Timothy. He's saying, I charge you as a witness would be charged with telling the truth under the penalty of perjury. But I think for, Tim, for Paul, these words to Timothy are even more profound. It's more than that. It's more than just asking Timothy to make a childish pinky swear, something much greater. Because this has far-reaching consequences. If Timothy does not take up this charge, it's very possible that everything Paul has built in all the churches may become for naught because there may not be anybody to shepherd them. So Paul here is what the Bible refers to as passing his mantle. Now this word mantle is an old word, but it's the best word I could find to define what is happening in these few verses. Now this word mantle isn't the fireplace mantle, that's spelled a little bit differently. This mantle is used in the Bible, refers to a cloak or a covering of some kind. But in the Bible, when it's, that cloak is placed on someone else, they usually call it a mantle, and it signifies passing or transferring of power. And we see this in 1 Kings, where Elijah is coming to the end of his life, and he needs to, like Paul, find a replacement for himself, and he finds Elisha. He chooses Elisha by placing his mantle or coat over him. Similarly, Paul is passing the mantle of power from him to Timothy. Paul can't physically be there because he's in prison, so he's verbally going to pass this on to him. Now, it's in verse 2. We're going to get to the heart of the matter. The reason for this last chapter and Paul's actual charge or laying on of the mantle to Timothy, a charge that I think applies to us as well. Now, it's here in verse 2 that we're going to look at three questions. We're going to answer quickly three questions, and that is the why, the when, and the what of this charge. A charge that is not just for Timothy alone. So, that what is that charge again? Preach the word. Now, Pastor Chuck Smith in his commentary on this verse, gives us the why. In fact, interesting enough, his commentary starts out with that exact word. It says, why? Because it is the word of God that can change a man. It is the word of God that can inspire and bring the changes that can cleanse a man. So preach the word. Same charge that Timothy had. So that's the why. How about the when? Verse 2 answers that question. It basically says, be ready in season and out. In other words, preach the gospel when you feel like it. Also preach the gospel when you don't feel like it. Preach the gospel when it's convenient. Preach the gospel when it's not, when you're prepared, when you're not prepared. Preach at any time an opportunity arises. Someone asks you why you're so happy. Say, hey, I got the joy of the Lord in me. Someone's in need. First, fill that need, and then present the gospel to them. Someone's sick, introduce them to the great physician. Someone's at the end of their rope, introduce them to the Prince of Peace. Someone's dying, introduce them to the great physician who can give them eternal life, even in the face of death. You know, I think if Nike had been around at this time with their slogan, Paul might have just said to Timothy, just do it. You know, don't wait for the right time because there is no wrong time. And so we've got those two down. Now it comes to what? What are we supposed to preach? And basically, what we're to preach are the fundamental foundational truths of the gospel. Paul's charge to Timothy in his passage echoes Christ's charge to us 
in some of his last words as well. And we find this in Mark 16, 15, where Jesus tells us, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Almost the same charge that Timothy is getting from Paul. And that's why Paul's trying to get across to Timothy, preach the foundational, fundamental truths of God. So now you're going to have to ask, right, what are the foundational, fundamental truths of God? We're going to go through three right here. One, simple. All men have sinned. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That is a fundamental, foundational truth. Number two, Christ died for our sins. Romans 5.8 says, But God demonstrated his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. A fundamental, foundational truth. And number three, that faith in Jesus Christ saves. Acts 16.31 tells us that. It says, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Ephesians said it long before I did and far better than I could. In Ephesians 2, 8, 9, we read, for by grace you have been saved through faith and not faith that of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man boast. Three fundamental foundational truths. These three simple truths from the scripture that all men sinned, that Christ died for them, and that faith in Jesus saves are not very complex. In fact, they're almost too simple. People out there are looking for something more. They're looking for formulas. They're looking for things to do. But there's nothing to do. But yet, these three simple steps are transformational in many, many lives. A guy by the name of Alistair Begg said it this way. He said, the main things are the plain things. And the plain things are the main things. No need to get caught up in questioning how many angels can fit on the head of a pin. There are some things that just don't work and that aren't going to contribute to preaching the word. Pastor Chuck Smith would say it like this. Simply teach the Bible. Simply teach the fundamental foundational truths of the gospel. Now, Paul told Timothy to preach the word. Paul defines this idea of preaching the word more specifically in 1 Corinthians 1.23, where he says, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. Paul is saying that the only important thing, and he says this throughout his whole life, is that we preach Christ. And he goes on at some point to say, in him crucified. Paul may well have said, instead of preach the word, preach Christ. But when I read, preach the word, the first thing that popped into my mind was the book of John, the first chapter, the first verse, where John defines what that word means. And he says in John 1, 1, in the beginning was the word, and the word was God, or the word was with God, and the word was God. Here John has defined Jesus Christ as the word. And we just saw, too, that Paul defined Christ as the Word. So you may ask, why is this so important? For it is the Word of God that saves, not us, and we should be very thankful for that. We simply bring the message. The rest is up to God. And we're to bring the Word of God. Paul says to Timothy, just the Word, nothing else. Timothy, speak only what God has already spoken through His Word, no more or no less. Finishing up now in verse 2, we come to a series of words, convince, rebuke, exhort, with all long-suffering and teaching. Now, I actually spent some time on this first word, convince. And in the end, I became convinced that what we're being told to do here is show the truth of the gospel by teaching the gospel from the scriptures. I don't believe Paul is telling Timothy to use clever arguments or to come up with very special ways to do this. He's simply saying, preach the word. Preach it simply. Teach it simply. Convince people 
by the word of God. Rebuke. Timothy is being told to weed out those people that within the church and other places that are really producing false strategies. And we see that a lot today. There are a lot of people preaching false doctrines, false ideas, and he's telling Timothy, as he tells all of us, who should have an understanding of the Word of God, that we're to weed this out. We're to tone those out, push those aside, listen only to His Word, and exhort. We all should be exhorting each one of us to continue in the faith, to continue to spread the Word, to continue to love on God, and to do what He has asked us to do. So Paul gives Timothy these three things as a way of something to do. Now we come to verses 3 and 4. In these two verses, we come to the warning that Paul is going to give to Timothy. Sometimes, you know, we get an idea in our head that it's only in our time that a warning like this applies. That the hatred of sound Christian doctrine is something that only happens in this particular time and in this particular century, you know, 19... 19th, 20th century, and even though, you know, Timothy was 2,000 years ago, so maybe it wasn't the same, but yet it was. In fact, 2,000 years before Timothy, we find a man by the name of Noah who was preaching the gospel that men's sins need to be forgiven, and he was rebuked, mocked, and laughed at. So, basically, this will happen to all of us that that preach the gospel. And he's warning Timothy, this is going to happen. Who better to know about being persecuted for preaching the gospel than Timothy? You know, I imagine in Jesus' time that it wasn't much longer after Jesus started that some people began to realize, hey, this guy's got something. We should duplicate it. We should try to do this. And there were people who came up and tried to imitate his method and his style. In fact, they may well have even taken some of his words and used them. But they would add their own twist. For their real purpose was not the gospel, but popularity and maybe profit. Not much has changed again since that time. Solomon tells us there's nothing new under the sun. It was going on in Paul's time, and it's going on in our time. And Jesus warns of such. In Matthew 24, 4 and 5, he says, And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceive you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And in verse 24 of that chapter, he continues, For false Christs and false prophets will arise and show great signs and wonders, if possible, to deceive, if possible, even the elect. Verses 3 and 4 of Timothy were a stern warning to us to understand the doctrine and to listen to only sound doctrine because there is a time and it's now when sound doctrine will no longer be tolerated. And this ha when this happens, we may find people wanting to silence the voice of truth. And there always have been those who want to silence the voice of truth. You know, if you're of my vintage or maybe a little younger, you've seen prayer taken out of schools, the church taken out of the state, even symbols of Christianity being removed because of how offensive they are. There are those who will seek to remove anything they feel is convicting of them and their sin. Now, in 1934, a group of people set up an eight-foot cross in the Mojave Desert. Now, this cross, to get to it, was 12 miles in one direction off a main highway and six miles in another direction off that main highway. So it was really in the middle of nowhere. Unless you physically went to find it, drove there, you wouldn't know it was there. Volunteers maintained that cross, and it was on private land. Even after it had been destroyed once, they rebuilt it and maintained it. But in the intervening years from 1934, the land reverted from private to public land. And so a lawsuit was brought against that cross. In 2002, a court ruled that that cross could not stand. But rather than tear it down, they said, you simply have to box it up. And so they put a box around the cross. 
The cross, like the gospel, is convicting. People don't want to face the reality of God, so they try to go to great lengths to hide from him, as though putting a box around the cross would keep the gospel from spreading. Adam and Eve hid from God after they had sinned because they didn't want to face the consequences of their actions. Today, people hide from sin as well. They lash out at anything that convicts them of sin. You know, I guess for this cross, it really plays on the idea that out of sight, out of mind, people don't want to hear the truth of the gospel at all. Now, later in verse 5, Paul tells Timothy to endure affliction. Paul knows firsthand about affliction. He knows what it is to be beaten. In fact, he was stoned and killed in Lystra. So he's well aware of what he's talking. Now, the idea that this gospel is offensive has crept into even mainline denominational churches. We have churches worried about offending people by preaching the gospel. Churches know that they'll get more people in on a Sunday morning if they preach a watered-down uh, version of the gospel. Staying true to the gospel is not necessarily what people want to hear. And there may be a simple reason for this, that people show up when the gospel isn't preached. And that's because our adversary, Satan, doesn't really have to worry about these people. In fact, doesn't have to worry about anybody who's really not following after God. And so he leaves them alone. And so it's much easier for these churches to grow. You know, the church is already following Satan's game plan. No sense upsetting the apple cart, he says. They reason, look, let's just get people in. Let's not offend them with the truth of the gospel. Let's soft soap them into coming. No one really needs to hear about sin and its consequences. Isn't that old-fashioned anyways? Don't we really not care and believe that stuff anymore? You know, if we make the gospel acceptable, then more people will come. The seats will be full, the offering plates brimming, and they figure maybe if somebody wants somewhere down the road to know a little more, we can go deeper, but not today. They strategize that what we need is a clever marketing ploy, music that plays on people's emotions, sermons that make you feel good about yourselves, but never anything too convicting. Or, hey, I got an idea. Let's throw in a great light show as well. That ought to bring people in. This is just what Paul's talking about when he talks about itching ears who want to hear. People want to be told they're okay. They want to be told to feel good about themselves. People want to be patted on the back and told, don't worry, God really won't send you to hell. There is no sin. He's a loving God. Don't worry about it. Set up a church and preach a gospel like this, and your pews will probably be, or chairs will probably be filled Sunday after Sunday. Paul tells people, Timothy, that this is what people want to hear, and they will find teachers who will give this to them. I worked for a short period of time with a Russian draftsman, and when we would have to do something, he would always use this phrase. He would say, we have to give boss what he needs, not what he wants. And that's what Paul's talking to Timothy here. Don't give the people what they want. Give them what they need to hear. And Timothy, by the way, Paul says, you may come under fire for the gospel. You may be verbally, physically, financially hurt by doing this. But don't give up. He says, endure the affliction. Evangelize the gospel. Fulfill your ministry. Each of us is a born-again believer in Christ, have a ministry to fulfill. And each of us are charged, like Timothy, with fulfilling that ministry. So now, moving on to verse 6. Paul says in verse 6 that he's about to be poured out as a drink offering. Drink offering. That's a very odd phrase to use. Probably doesn't mean too much to us because we're not Jewish of that time period. But if you were, you would understand. And to understand, we have to go back, way back to Moses. When, Moses, when God talked to Moses, he told him, when the people enter the promised land, they are to provide burnt offerings by fire. And then at the end of the offering, they're to pour wine over that burnt offering. 
that pouring of the wine was called the drink offering. And to understand the meaning of that, we have to look back in the book of Numbers, the 15th chapter, the 7th verse. And it says, as a drink offering, you shall offer one-third of a hin of wine as a sweet aroma to the Lord. Now, any Jewish person reading this passage would have immediately understood what the drink offering meant and that it followed the sacrifice. Paul is telling Timothy that he has offered himself to God as a living sacrifice. And in death, he will be poured out as that drink offering, a sweet aroma to God. Paul in Romans tells us to present our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable, which is our reasonable service. Paul never looked on suffering in his life as anything but reasonable service. service. His whole life had been presented to God as a living sacrifice. Now he compares his death to being poured to that of pouring out of wine, which is the last act of a sacrificial ceremony. His death becomes his final sacrifice, his reasonable service. Now we come to verse 7, where I think Paul is bragging a little bit. After all, if Paul's been through, I think we can accept a little conceit from the guy. In one sentence, Paul sums up his entire life. He says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. How great would it be to live a life where those words were the words that defined it. Paul is at the end of his marathon. He can see the finish line. He's about to breast the finish tape. Just a few more feet. And then he can rest. Paul is often couching metaphors in sports talk. Paul even told the Corinthians that they should run the race as to obtain a prize. Since the prize is given to only the first, run the race to win. And verse 8 plays off of this theme of obtaining a prize for winning. In verse 8 we read, Finally there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day. And then Paul adds this. He says, And not to me only, but also to all who love his appearance. From this, we can see that Paul did not intend this book to be written just, this letter just to Timothy, but obviously to many. Now, I don't know if you're aware of it or not, but God does promise rewards for us in heaven when we get there. Paul talks about one here. He says he's going to get the crown of righteousness. James talks about a crown of life that's given to those that love Jesus Christ. Paul, Peter talks about a crown of glory that will never fade. And in Revelation, we're told to hold fast so that no one takes our crown. Now, you may have noticed earlier that I skipped over part of verse 1. You thought maybe it will good, it'll go quicker. But I want to pick that up right now. I want to pick up the last half of verse 1, which says, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Jesus, God, is going to judge all of us, both the living and the dead. And Paul's saying to Timothy, when Christ returns, he will judge people, and he will re reward you based on your faithfulness. And because there is a judgment, Paul in verse 8 is emphatically imploring Timothy to share the gospel. He's telling him, don't go to heaven found wanting, wanting to have done more for God, wanting to have done more for your calling, wanting to have shared the gospel more. Verse 1 is a warning about judgment. Well, verse 8 is the rewards if we follow Paul's prescription. You know, it's kind of like Paul bookends this, these eight verses with the judgment and the reward. And the point is, he says to Timothy, don't forget that when your life is over, God rewards us for what we've done in his name, you will receive rewards. And Paul says, you see, I'm actually getting one. 
So there's where the little bit of conceit comes in. I should point out here, God is not a socialist. Everyone will not be getting the same crown. The handing out of crowns will not be equitable, but it will be fair based on our faithfulness. Now, that doesn't mean that you need to be a pastor. It doesn't mean you need to be ordained. It doesn't mean that you need to start a mega church. All you need to do is remain faithful to what God is calling you to do. Faithfully use the gifts that you've been given as your reasonable service. In Matthew, Jesus tells the story of the parable of the talents. Here a man is going on a trip, and he gives three people talents, coins, an amount of money. To the first, he gives one. To the second, he gives two. To the third, he gives five. When the man returns, he's looking for an accounting of what they did with these talents. All but one has increased what he was given. The man with two made it four. The man with five made it ten. But the man with one hoarded it away and didn't do anything with it. And from that man, the man who gave out the coins took it from him and gave it to the one who had ten. That single talent was taken away, leaving the one with none. The parable tells us that our, there will be rewards for what we've done based on our faithfulness. The man with one talent was not faithful in what he had been given, so from him it was all taken. Don't be that guy. Now, I've called 2 Timothy a pastoral epistle, but again, not just for pastors, but for anyone. For anyone who loves Christ and looks forward to his second coming. I want to close this morning with a story. In the Sunday schools, they're talking about heroes of the faith. I've kept pushing that. So I wanted to be sure that maybe you guys could hear one of these. Now, I doubt that you ever heard of this guy. His name is Henry Martin. He died at the age of 31, over 200 years ago. But he spent 31 years of his life in great service to God. Henry Martin attended St. John's College in Cambridge, England. While there, Martin's pastor was a, name, was a man by the name of Charles Simeon. Charles Simeon was also pastor of Trinity Church, Cambridge, England. Martin and Simeon, they became very good friends. Through Simeon's influence and another man, a missionary by the name of David Bernard, Henry became burdened with the idea to take the gospel to foreign lands. Ultimately, he ended up in India, where while there, he translated the New Testament into Urde, translated the New Testament into Persian, worked on a Persian Bible, translating the Psalms into Persian the Gospels in the jail persic for Jewish communities in the Persian Empire, open schools for Indian children, and in his spare time, he visited hospitals. Now, through all this time, he became very ill, but against doctor's orders, he continued. He went to Persia to correct the New Testament he had written, went to Arabia to translate an Arabic version of the New Testament, had his portrait painted, Keep that in mind. We're going to come back to that. Opened a church in Calcutta, India. Presented the gospel before Islamic and Hindu teachers, teachers of Sufism, before Muslim, Jews, Jewish Muslims, and political authorities. And all this before his 30th birthday. Through an intermediary, he presented the Shah of Iran at that time with a Persian version of the New Testament. The Shah was actually very thankful, and he wrote him a letter. I'm going to read you the last sentence of that letter. The Shah says, the whole of the New Testament is completed in the most excellent manner, a source of pleasure to our enlightenment and august mind. The Shah was impressed with his work. Now, this last account of giving the Shah the Bible took place in 1812, it took place in the summer of 1812. Shortly after that, Henry Martin took ill and died in October of 1812, just 31 years old. Now, remember Henry Martin's friend, Charles Simeon? Charles Simeon was sent the portrait that had been painted of Henry Martin. 
Charles Simeon hung that par portrait in his study in Cambridge. And anyone who came in to that study, Simeon would show it off and say, see that blessed man? No one looks at me like he does. He never takes his eyes off me. And he seems to always be saying, the years are short, be serious, be in earnest, don't trifle, don't trifle. And then Simeon would add, I'm not trifling, I'm not. That word trifle, that's an old word too. But it really means don't bother with things that are unimportant, things that have no real consequence. You know, no one could say that Henry Martin trifled. Time is short. The world isn't any happier to hear the gospel today than it was in Timothy's time or Noah's. Understand, I'm not advocating that all of us drop everything, drop all of our stuff, and go off to a foreign land as a missionary. There are those that God has called to this type of work, but I don't believe he calls us all. But if he has, great is your reward when you answer that call. But for the rest of us, we need to simply give the gospel simply to those around us. Sometimes, whether they want to hear it or not, all of us should take heart to these words from Ephesians 5, where we read, be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand that what the Lord's will is. We've seen in this passage what the will of the Lord is for us. All of us to spread the gospel, the fundamental foundational truths of the gospel. You know, for we are all uniquely positioned to reach the exact people that God has for us to reach. There is someone out there for whom you are uniquely qualified to reach. Let's work today on trifling less as the days go by. We should run this race that's been set before us, this race we call life. We should run it to win for both the gospel's sake and our heavenly rewards. Nothing wrong with that. Let's work on trifling less and let's strive to make Romans 1.16 our anthem. For it reads, For I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and then the Gentile. Let's pray. Father God, we all confess that there are times that we trifle. We trifle away the time that you have given us. Lord, we are so grateful for those like Henry Martin who have gone before, who gave all for your word, everything. We thank you for Paul who gave all for your word. Lord, we just pray that you would put a burden on each one of us today, a burden possibly for just a person or for people, Lord, that we know, people that we can preach the word to. Father God, it's sometimes very difficult for any of us to do this, but Lord, I just pray today that you would help us in this endeavor, that we would all ask, to whom can we bring this great gospel? this gospel message that says we have sinned. Christ died for that sin and we can be forgiven. He was looking forward to something beyond earth. We ask, Lord, that you put that kind of fire in us that we begin to realize that earth is not our home, that there is a place beyond here where we will never sorrow, there will be no tears, and we will forever be in your peace and joy. And Lord, I pray that if there's someone here this morning, or someone hearing these words, who has yet to grasp the concept of the gospel, 
Realize it's that simple. Realize that you've sinned. And there's no one who can say they haven't. Understand that Christ died for those sins. And all you need to do is believe that he died for your sins. Just ask him, as the thief on the cross did, to remember you when your life ends and you come into his kingdom. And he will forgive you. He will guide you. He will direct you. And then you can begin understanding how to preach the word to others. Lord, again, thank you for this day that at least we are forced a day to remember you because sometimes, Lord, without that day, we may forget and time would pass and would pass. I ask, Lord, that you again just bless those who are here and those who are listening. Give them a great day of peace in your name. Lord, I pray that you bring people across their path as well and give them the strength to say something. All these things, Lord, we pray in your name, in Jesus' name, amen. So in order to do that effectively, we need to be poured out just like Paul was poured out. And, um, and as Jesus poured himself out to, for us. And um, so to be vessels, uh, to be used of God. And I was just pondering that as we were, as Pastor was closing. And I was like, thank you for reminding us of that. these pieces broken and scattered in mercy gathered mended and torn empty handed but not forsaken I've been set free I've been set free
God, we just thank you, Lord, for this time here this morning. Lord, we thank you for all of our many blessings that you bestow upon us. Amen. Father, we had a ta thousand tongues. We could not thank you enough. Yes, Lord, Jesus. you are King of kings and Lord of lords and worthy yes, of all of our praise. Thank you, Lord. We just thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 